Hello, everybody. Welcome back. In this session, we would begin speaking about faith and anxiety. You see, because faith is the substance of things hoped for, and with faith, you already have the substance and the evidence of what you're hoping for, faith and anxiety cannot coexist. Faith and anxiety cannot live together in the same person. You either have faith or you have anxiety. That is how it works. You see, the reason for that is simple because with faith, you already have the substance for the thing for which you are anxious. If you have the substance for the thing for which you are anxious, then there's no need for anxiety. You are not anxious for the things you have. You are only anxious for the things you do not have. With faith, you already have it. You have the substance and you have the evidence. So you are not anxious anymore. Praise the Lord. With hope, you can be anxious. But with faith, you cannot be anxious. Because with faith, you already have it. With hope, you would have it someday. Hope is in the future tense. Faith is in the present tense. Faith, I have it. I have the substance. I have the evidence. I know I am saved by faith. I am saved by grace through faith. Not, um, it's not that you're hoping to be saved. You already are saved. So, faith and anxiety do not go hand in hand. If you have a million dollars, you will not be worried about something that costs a thousand dollars. You will just go into the shop, give the substance of the thousand dollars, and get what you need. With faith, you have the substance of the power of God available to you like a million dollars like a billion dollars and so everything else becomes small compared to your faith remember faith by faith we overcome the world this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith god has given you so much that you cannot be anxious for so little we serve a big god who has given us so much so so little that we need on earth should not be causing us anxiety. The Bible says that be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So ask in faith, ask in faith, ask in hope, but don't be anxious. Anxiety, depression are not part of our lifestyle because we serve a big God. We serve a mighty God. Praise the Lord. Faith can still delay. Even when you've had the substance in your heart, it can take a while for that substance to manifest. It took many years for Abraham to have Isaac. It took Joseph many years for his dreams to come to pass. But when faith delays in that way, it is hope that it is uh, patience that comes to his rescue. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, the Bible says that we should be like those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let us be like those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So not just faith, but faith working together with patience. When you have received the substance in your heart and it has not yet materialized, you need patience. Abraham had to have patience. Joseph had to have patience. You have to have patience for the manifestation of the things that God has said. And you need patience, which is a fruit of the Spirit. It is not of you. It is the Holy Spirit generating the patience that you need for those things to come to pass. So it's still a blessing. Faith, therefore, is stronger than hope. Because with faith, you have it. With hope, you will have it. It is better to have it than to hope that you will have it someday. So go for faith. Don't stop at hope. A lot of believers run around jumping singing and shouting and all they have is hope they don't have faith they don't believe in fact they've stopped believing they are just hoping that someday something will happen that will change that story we have to be people of faith people of substance not just people of hope people of hope are not people of substance people of faith are people of substance they have it they move around singing and rejoicing because they have it even if, if, if even if it has not yet manifested they have it Praise the Lord. 
Let me use the example of salvation to explain this point further. What if our salvation was just by hope? What if we only hoped that we were saved? Our Christian walk will be very miserable if all we had was a hope. There are certain branches of Christianity or certain churches, denominations, that believe that you cannot know that you are saved. You cannot have the assurance of your salvation on earth. Some of these have talked with me, I've talked with them. They say, you cannot know you are saved until you die and go to heaven and you know that you are saved. Yeah, that is because they are walking on hope. They are not walking on faith. If you are walking on faith, you have the assurance of your salvation now. So when you die, you are not expecting any surprises. So your Christian walk is vibrant. It's joyful. You know that you know that you know that you're saved and going to heaven. You're not doubting. You're not waiting to know when you die. You already know. How many of us know that it is better to know than to hope that you'll be saved? In Romans chapter 10 verse 9 to 10, the Bible says, if you, let me read it. Romans 10 verse 9 to 10. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In verse 13, it says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are already saved. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 i'll read that first john chapter 5 verse 13 i want to read it from the bible so you can hear it says first john chapter 5 verse 13 these things i have written to you who believe in the name of the son of god that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. He did not say that, that you may hope that you have eternal life. He said that you may know. These things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe, to know, that you, and continue to know that you have eternal life and believe, in the, in the name of the Son of God. So when you go to heaven, you will not be expecting any surprises. You already have the assurance of your salvation. Faith gives you the assurance of your salvation. Hope gives you doubt and worry until you get to heaven first. It will be very pitiful if you have salvation and you don't have the assurance until you get to heaven. But if you have the salvation and you have the assurance, you are better off. Praise the Lord. Let me explain this concept of faith and hope from my personal example, a personal testimony to kind of crystallize it to you in a way that probably you'll be able to understand best. I was living in Canada and I was living in Sweden some years ago, pastoring there. I had my wife and children and uh, I wasn't feeling at home. I was pastoring, living in a foreign country and the one sense that I had was that Sweden was not for me. It was a temporary place. It was not a permanent location. I did not feel at home after some time. I had accomplished, had a master degree in water resources engineering, walked, was pastoring, but I wasn't feeling at home. And I, I had the visit from a man of God, a great man of God in my church, and I asked him, what should I do with my life? And he said, go and pray and ask God, and God will tell you what to do with your life. That was probably the best advice he could give me because that built faith. I went and heard for myself and I built faith and it came to pass. So I took a fast, a 21 day fast, went into the presence of God and asked God uh, what to do with my life, where to move with my family. I wasn't feeling at home and satisfied and happy and fulfilled. Even though I was in ministry and in a foreign land and it wasn't enough. My problem was I wasn't feeling at home. I wasn't really fulfilled. God told me in that fast that I should move my family to Canada 
I should write a book and start a Bible school. Right now, as I speak, all those three things have come to pass. But I learned a valuable lesson after God spoke. When God said, move your family to Canada, it gave me hope and strong consolation that I was supposed to move my family to Canada. So I went around telling people, I'll move to Canada, I'll move to Canada, God has said. That was the mistake and the error I made. Well, from learning back, backwards, I was supposed to take the hope that I was supposed to move to Canada to the presence of God behind the veil and ask God how. Because I was in, Ca in Sweden, I did not have the visa and passport to come to Canada. How was I to move to Canada? was God's expectation that I would stop by and ask him how. But I, instead, I ran out to the crowds like many of us do. When we hear the least word, we run to the crowds. And we run in hope, not in faith. So I went ahead, applied for a student visa, applied for an admission, application to a school in, in Canada. And I got admission and a scholarship, two scholarships. I applied for the visa and it was denied. And I was shocked. I said, but God has said, and I had admission and scholarship. What happened? What went wrong? So I was disappointed. I felt I heard wrongly. So I moved from Sweden to Denmark because I said, well, maybe God wants me in Sweden. But Sweden was not cutting it for me. I went to Denmark and God gave me a green card, three years stay in, in Denmark with my family. And during that time, I thought I would start feeling at home. I still did not feel at home. So I prayed to God again, took courage. After many years, I went to God. I said, God, where do I really take my family to? I'm still not feeling at home in Denmark. And the Lord said, I said Canada. It was very harsh and clear and strong, a strong voice. I said Canada. Am I a God who changes? If I've said Canada, I mean Canada. And so I said, God, where were you when the visa was denied? Where were you? And he told me, it was very clear in my heart that he did not send me to apply for a student visa. Because with student visa, I was going to come to Canada and go to school when I don't really want to go to school. What I want is the citizenship or the permanent residence. And he has called me to come to Canada to do a ministry, not to waste my time in school. To go straight to do work and ministry and take care of my family and take care of the ministry. So God's plans are always better than my plans. So... I had planned that I would come through school, but God wanted me to come through citizenship, Canada, uh, permanent residence, and his plan was better than my own, and that's biblical. And so when he told me that I didn't tell you to apply as a student, I, I repented because I, actually he did not tell me to apply as a student. So I asked God, how should I go to Canada? Then he said, by permanent residence, apply for permanent residence. So I, I kind of a little bit grumbled, complained, I said, God, is it not a little bit foolish? Is it not folly that a country that has denied you student visa, you should apply for permanent residence? Which one is bigger, student visa or permanent residence? Permanent residence is bigger. If they deny me student visa, they will surely deny me permanent residence. But then God, in my spirit, it was like, are you doing it or not? Will you do it or not? Will you trust and obey like Naaman? Would you go to the Jordan and dip yourself? Would you do it? Would you split the Red Sea? Would you speak to the rock? So I went and obeyed, humbled myself, repented for going my way, trying to apply on my own in my strength. And I went and applied for permanent residence and it was granted immediately, immediately. And as we speak, I am in Canada. I have written the book. I have started the Bible school. And my life is happy. I feel at home. In fact, when I came to Canada the very first time, at the airport, there were two lines. One was for students and Visitors. Another one was for citizens and permanent residents. I took the line for citizens and permanent residents because I was a permanent resident with my family. And when we came, the person who was at the gate said, Welcome home. I will never forget those words. He said, Welcome home to Canada. That is the power of the Word of God. When God has spoken, it carries life in it. The revealed word of God carries God's life in it and it will come to pass if you trust and obey. Praise the Lord. I hope that helps. I hope you understand why everything is possible for him who believes. The reason is because you are believing in what God has already said. And what God has already said has God's life and power and substance in it. 
That's why everything is possible to him who believes because you're believing in God's power. You're believing in God's ability. So what he tells you to do is very little compared to what he will actually do. This is because when God has spoken, nothing can stop it. Because when God speaks a, a revealed word, it has God's life in it. And it is potent and able to bring life to dead situations and impossibilities become possible. When you dare to believe God's word, you are a person of substance. And with that substance in your heart, you have confidence and boldness. The Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. The Bible says the wicked run, though no one is chasing, but the righteous is as bold as a lion. You walk around like someone who has a secret, and indeed you have a secret. You have a secret with God. God has given you a word. He has told you what to do, and you know it will come to pass. Even though what he has told you sounds a little bit weak, but power would be released when you do it. Gideon was told to fight an army with 300 And God did the, the, the God fought for them. I don't know if it's three hundred thousand people that God told him to fight a battle with, and they won. Because God would tell you, so that you do not negate His power, you do not think you overcame by His power. The reason why God told Gideon to fight with so few people was because. God was saying, lest you people believe that it is by your power that you have won the battle. God always wants you to know that your part is very little, his part is very big. So he reduced Gideon's people. Those who drank water in a certain way, he sent them home. Those who had married wives recently, he sent them away. Those who had bought a house recently, he sent them away. So he was left with a few people to fight such a big army. And they did not even need to fight in that battle. The enemies fought themselves and killed themselves and they just came and took the spoils so what god will tell you is very little but when you obey he will release great power i'm saying sharing this to you second year students because with this you have the possibility of starting churches god will tell you start a church god will tell you start a bible school god will tell you start a business it may sound uh silly it may sound weak like folly but when you obey you would see the results, the fruit, lives will be changed. Uh, nations change. You can change a city, you can change a nation. You can pastor a nation, pastor a city, you can pastor a church. Amen. You can start a business that will be multi billion and be a blessing to kingdom businesses and be a, a blessing to the Bible school and to churches and to believers. So don't, don't doubt what God tells you. Test it, but don't doubt it. When you've tested it, trust it and obey. Amen. And it will come to pass. The Bible says that in Luke chapter 1 verse 37, For with God, nothing will be impossible. Let that sink in. You serve a mighty God. With Him, nothing shall be impossible. He is not like a man. He does great things. And in the same way, in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If you can believe the word of God, if you can believe the revealed word of God, the rhema of God, all things are possible to him who believes. That is why all things are possible, because it is God doing the heavy lifting. You are just simply believing and doing a little thing, and God does the rest. In this session, I will try to explain to you something that is really good. I call it good news. Um, you can exercise faith for someone else. You can actually exercise faith for someone else. In the past, I've always believed that I can only exercise faith for myself. It's always me, me, my faith. The Bible says the just shall live by their own faith. But sometimes, God allows you to exercise faith and be a blessing for someone else. If I did not exercise my faith to start a Bible school, I will not be a blessing to so many around the world. So your faith helps other people. Your faith cannot save somebody, but your faith can, you can intercede in faith for somebody else to be saved. You can pray for your family members to be saved. You can believe God for their salvation, but you, you cannot, your faith cannot save them, literally. 
they need their own faith for salvation. But you need your faith can heal somebody. And I will show you from scriptures. In Luke chapter 5, from verse 17 to 26, the Bible tells us about a story of four friends who carried one of their friends who was paralytic, paralyzed. And they brought him to a meeting place where Jesus was. Because Jesus is the light, he is the one who heals, the healer. They brought this man there for Jesus to heal him. But there was no way, no room in the house, no space in the door. It was crowded, packed. So they decided to go to the roof and break the ceiling and lower this person to Jesus for healing so that Jesus could heal him. And the Bible says that Jesus saw their faith and he turned to the man and he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. And because the Pharisees were doing all kinds of arguments in their hearts whether Jesus has the right to forgive sins, Jesus said, which one is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise up and walk? So he said, so that you may know that the Son of Man has the right, the power to forgive sins. Rise up, take up your bed and go. And so he healed, he forgave that man and healed him because of the faith of the four friends. It all started with four friends who were bold enough to carry their friend to Jesus. They knew that when they brought that friend to Jesus, Jesus would heal him. Heal him. So they did not, they were not afraid to break somebody's ceiling to to bring healing to somebody, to their friend. Faith sometimes is aggressive. It breaks ceilings. It breaks barriers. It steps in the way for others. Your faith makes a way for another person. Because of my faith to start a Bible school, a lot of people are supposed to be blessed through me. And that is what your faith can do. You can start a church. You can start a Bible school. You can start a ministry, a business that can bless many. So your faith can be a blessing to others. But even more, your faith can help somebody person, some other person get healing. And this one story of the four friends is an example of that. Another story is found in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 to 13. A centurion came to Jesus and he said, My servant is at the point of death. Would you come and, and heal my servant? Would you heal my servant? And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And the centurion said, no, no, master. I am a man under authority, just like you are a man of authority and under authority. I say to my servants, go and they go. Come and they come. Do this and they do it. Only, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Only speak the word and my servant will be healed. So speak the word in faith and my servant will be healed. He understood the principle of faith. That all Jesus needed was to speak a word and if he spoke the word in faith, the servant will be healed wherever that servant was. So if you look at this story, Jesus did not ever meet this centurion's servant. So it was not the centurion's servant's faith that healed him. It was the centurion's faith that healed his servant. So your faith can lead to the healing of somebody else. You can intercede for somebody. You can stand in the gap for somebody and pray for somebody and they will be healed because of your prayers. So I encourage you, do not give up on people. Do not point at people and say you do not have faith, so you're sick. You do not have faith, so you're suffering. Step in. Let your faith be the catalyst that would raise up that person from that situation and change that situation around. It is time that we begin to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The Bible says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Carry people before the Lord in prayer and in faith. And ask God to breathe life into those people's situations. Ask God to give substance to your faith for the, for the people. It is easier for you to grow in faith when you are standing in, in faith for others than for yourself. And when you have grown in faith for others, then you can grow in faith for yourself. Praise the Lord. Let's talk about the Canaanite woman. Matthew chapter 15 verse 21 to 28. She came to Jesus and she said, My daughter is sick and seriously demon possessed. And Jesus said, I am sent back to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. The woman said, Well, even if you are sent to the lost sheep, is there no, no small healing for me? And uh, Jesus said, when Jesus looked at her faith, Jesus healed her daughter. He said, go, let it be unto you. 
Woman, great is your faith. Be unto you according to your faith. It was her faith that healed her daughter. So you can stand in the gap for your children. You can stand in the gap for your servants. You can use your faith and take your faith to God and pray for people and God can give you substance and life for other people through your faith. Talk about Lazarus. Lazarus was dead. He had no faith. Jesus raised him up by grace. Maybe with a little help of faith from Mary and Martha. But it was some, sometimes some things are done by grace. The widow's son was dead. He had no faith. I don't know if the widow even had faith. Jesus just stepped in and touched the coffin, the casket, and the boy rose up to life. Your faith can heal another person. You can take somebody in God in prayer by intercession. And God can do miracles. We would end this session with that story. I will give you this assignment to do it on your own. Ask God, um, write down three of your desires that you want to see in your life. And let one of those desires be for somebody else. Take those three desires to God and ask the Holy Spirit to give you a scripture. A promise in the Bible that tells you that God can give you that promise. Uh, or that desire. And then ask God for faith and substance and life to be given to those desires that have now become hope. So write down three desires. Let one of them be for somebody else. Ask the Holy Spirit for a scripture to support the fact that God can give you or God wants to give you or that those desires are in line with the will of God. I don't want you praying for something that is not the will of God. Let there be a scripture and a promise in the Bible that backs it. And you repeat that to God and say, God, because you said by your stripes I'm healed, so I'm praying for my healing and for the healing of this friend. And take that to God as long as it takes. Keep praying for that desire. And when it happens, share the testimony with others. And share with me if you see me, if you can. Send me an email. Send us an email at Bible School and we'll rejoice with you. Write down three desires. Let one of them be for somebody else. Pray, pray, and pray. Go into the Holy of Holies before the, 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 behind the veil where the forerunner, Jesus, has gone ahead, our King, and ask God to give life to that hope. And when he does, come and testify. Go and see the results and pray and do whatever he tells you to do. And you would see the power of God move. And continue doing that until Jesus returns and you will see your faith grow. Praise the Lord. Stay tuned for the next session.